Hey, uh, welcome everybody. Great to have you with us today uh, for conversation, education in the right. Um, what we're going to dig into is at a time when there is evident polarization, enormous polarization across the country, fierce debate about many issues. Education is no different. Uh, whether we're talking about what we see in college and on college campuses, uh, fights about policies over critical race theory and SEL and school choice in K-12, uh, how to tackle challenges in early childhood. Uh, we see um, enormous energy uh, in terms of the right versus the left and what this side should be for. Um, part of the challenge here is that on the right, uh, as Mike and I talk about in our new book, Getting Education Right, uh, the right has often been better at explaining what we're against or what's problematic than sketching a vision of what you were for. What we want to talk about today is how the right has gotten to this point on education, where this point is, and what a principled conservative vision of educational improvement should look like going forward when we talk about early childhood, K-12, or higher education. Uh, today's event is gonna proceed in two parts. Uh, on the first panel, uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have uh, Virginia's Secretary of Education, Amy Guadera, uh, here who's gonna have a conversation with me and Mike about what's in our new book, Getting Education Right. Um, after about 25, 30 minutes, uh, we're gonna switch out. Uh, we're gonna bring up a couple of distinguished uh, uh, scholars uh, who are gonna join the panel. I'll move into a facilitator role, and we'll have a broader conversation about where we are in the questions of the moment. Um, towards the end of the event, we'll move to Q&A. Uh, online questions can be sent uh, to greg.fournier at aei.org. Uh, on the spelling, you'll have to guess, or <laughs> it's uh, greg.fournier uh, at aei.org, or, ha or the hashtag, uh, hashtag getting ed right. Uh, you can find uh, the book at the uh, Teachers College Press website. Uh, if you off enter the code AEI at checkout, you'll get 20% off. Um, and for those of you who are with us in person today, after the event, uh, we invite you to join us uh, in the hallway uh, for a drink and refreshments. Um, we've got Mike McShane, uh, National Director of Research at EdChoice, uh, and my fellow author on the new book. As I mentioned, we've got uh, Virginia Secretary of Education, Amy Guadera, and once again, I'm Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies at AEI. Uh, delighted to have you with us today. And I'm going to go take a seat. And Amy, if you could uh, get us started on the conversation. All right. Thanks, Rick. Am I on now? Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is such a delight and a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, and to be with old friends and to see so many friends in the audience here and hopefully online as well. Um, I first want to start by saying thanks. Thanks for writing this book. It was really fun to read, and knowing you both, it was also really fun to hear your voices come out so much. There's a couple lines in there about comparing an OSHA hearing to the, experiencing the Super Bowl that I really loved. Um, so you all have to go find that. Make sure you go pick up the book and read that. Um, and I also just want to say thank you also for writing it um, in this moment when there feels like there's so much tension in the world to create such a positive and clear and compelling message about why, as conservatives, we believe um, that it's really important to get education right. So thank you. It means a lot. Um, and I just want to lead that to my first question, which is, why now? Uh, you know, reading this book felt like personal history in lots of ways, going back, remembering when I was younger and thinner, and, I'm, and seeing all my friends in the audience there as well, and looking back and saying, we got right, things I wish we had done differently. Um, and we could have written this at lots of points in time, but why now? Why does it matter now that this story is out there? And then a second follow-up to that, what do you hope changes as a result of this book being out there? I'd say the, the why now could be that, um, well, it started, we, we got bored during the pandemic. <laughs> so some people baked sourdough bread, and we had this great idea to write a book. And, it, and it's really been, it, it's been a wonderful project that Rick and I worked on, and in a very kind of different than how you and I often write things. We really kind of ruminated this on a long time and passed a lot of drafts back and forth, and it was really a lovely, a lovely thing to be able to do. But I think the why now, uh, you know, it's tough to not start with something like the pandemic which was such a kind of dislocating effect. It caused so many people to rethink their relationships towards schools, um, whether that's early childhood education, daycare, whether that's about K-12 schools, whether that's about higher education. Um, and you know, I think a lot of what happened there just brought to the fore trends that were already
already happening. Some of the stuff that we trace out in the book is that it was, some of these things were rumbling and it just took the last, you know, pick your metaphor, the straw that breaks the camel's back to sort of break all of this open. Um, and so we were obviously coming out of that. We see all the things that are happening in higher education nowadays and not just the people in, in the congressional hearings and others, but things that are happening on college campuses. And I think, you know, there's that old saying, you can curse the darkness or you can try to light a candle. Um, and I think there's been lots of opportunity to curse the darkness and lots of opportunity to say, oh, here's this goofy thing that this school is doing, or isn't it terrible that those schools are, are doing that? But we thought it was really important to try and put forward this positive vision. Well, what might schools look like if they were guided by conservative principles? Not just, we want to be against this or against that, but what might be that, that better, better future for our students, our children, our nation? Yeah, um, I think that's all beautifully said. The other reason why now is, you know, Amy, for a lot of our professional lives, uh, education in the K-12 world felt purple. Um, the, the big question was not, are you conservative or progressive, but how do you feel about accountability? Or how do you feel about choice? Well, I think what, hap what we've seen happen over the last half decade or 10 years is that has fundamentally shifted. I think what used to be a conversation dominated by questions of how do you organize school and serve kids, has become a conversation which were many of our friends on the left um, have made it first and foremost about a series of what I suggest are pretty extreme dogmas. And therefore, in order to engage and respond effectively, it can't just be stopping those dogmas. It's got to be starting from a place of principle. What are we for? What is, what is the role of schools? And so in some sense, this is a response to the breakup of that education marriage and an attempt to offer a vision of how do we move forward um, in its aftermath. And, and I should say, oh, I should say, I didn't answer your second question. I was going to hold you accountable. There you go. No, I appreciate that. <laughs> Accountability already. Um, and some transparency, too, just to let you know. There we go. I love it. Well, I'll give you some choice. Well, you could keep playing this game. We won't. Um, uh, but I think, you know, what do we want to be different? I think part of it is that we want, particularly on the, speaking sort of for our friends on the right, and, uh, you know, movement that we're both part of, I think we want to see a bigger vision. I think oftentimes we can look quite narrowly of, well, how does this one policy or even this one area of children's lives, how can we figure out the best policy to increase reading and math scores on this or to raise graduation rates because of that? And I think what we try to do with this book by, by articulating these broader principles and thinking about how principles might apply whenever we're talking about education. If the child is three or 23, um, what are the constants that exist across all of those? It might give us this broader way to have a, a bigger conversation about what are the ends that we are trying to pursue? Like, what are we trying to do here? What is the point of all of this? And then that leads to questions like, well, then who do we want doing that? Who do we want teaching our kids? How do we want them to be prepared, et cetera? And then how do we want to organize a system to achieve those ends? But part of it, we've had a series of very narrow conversations. I think we wanted to take that step back and, 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 and broaden the lens. Can I add on to that? No, I love it. Okay, awesome. That's what I like so to So Rick, you brought up principles, so let's talk about values. Um, tell me what you think about conservative values in education. Why do they matter? What are they? And in the book, I know you go through them a lot, and again, everyone should go get this book and read it, but tell us some of the highlights. Sure. I mean, partly defense. Well, what do you mean by conservative? Um, obviously, we live in an era when politics is often defined by personalities. You know, I, you know, if you're a Republican, the question is, how do you feel about Donald Trump? But by conservative, we're not talking politically. Um, we're educators. We're not, we're not politicos. So we have the great luxury of when we talk about conservatism, talking, as we explain in the book, talking about a set of dispositions, a set of ways of thinking about the world that have been handed down to us by thinkers like Burke and Kirk and a number of others. And so for us, the, 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 what did, you know, we, and then we can have good faith arguments. There's, uh, you know, as many definitions of conservative as there are people who want to define it. But for us, the, the, the key principles here are a sense of personal responsibility, a sense of gratitude, a respect for things that work, a distrust of uh, utopian schemes. And so when Mike and I are talking about a conservative vision, it's a vision that's anchored in respect for the role of parents in the family, uh, the importance of communities, uh, the importance of affection for our shared history, for our shared... For our shared uh, Humanity. Um, it's a you know anchored in a belief in rigor, 
an unapologetic uh, embrace of things like excellence and merit and accomplishment. Keep singing. This is you're singing our tunes. Good. And uh, you know, a, 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 and then very much about the responsibility, the responsibility of educators, but also the responsibility of learners, the responsibilities of schools and colleges, but also the responsibility of the families that are sending those kids to school. And now what happens is even when we talk about these things today, one, we don't talk about a lot of this. Some of these things which we think of as no-brainers um, in certain precincts in education are treated as bad ideas or noxious ideas, which is to us, frankly, bizarre, and I, we think to most Americans. Um, but even folks who are embracing some of these things have wound up embracing them in a performative way. Or we talk about parental rights, but we don't hear much about parental responsibilities. And so for us, again, it's not about whose side are you on. It's about these ideas. It's about these principles, these precepts. And frankly, whether folks call themselves Republican or Democrat or something else, if these ideas resonate with them, that's great. We don't think of conservatives, conservative as belonging to this or that political camp. We think of it as a set of habits of mind. And one of, the, one of I think, our great joys have been, has been having people read the book and react to it and say, well, this doesn't actually feel that conservative to me. And we're like, well, that's wonderful. You know, you are welcome to anything here that you would like to embrace. Including endorsements from people who are definitely not Republicans. So that's a great statement. So it's good. Mike, you want to add anything? No, it's be yeah, it was brilliant. It was great. And thank you for laying those out. Um, so the conversation's already begun. The discussion is taken off in, in Twitter sphere, whatever we call it now, and online and on blogs, and that's what books do, right? They create conversations, and I really think that and hope that that's what this book does. It gets people talking and discussing and debating. Uh, and so let me bring one of those debates here. So one of our friends wrote and said, really great, but there's some things that I wish you talked more about. And so, you know, Checker this morning said, wow, I'd really love to have seen more about what is a conservative agenda within schools, that most Americans um, want to have their community school be their home school of choice. Uh, and why didn't you all talk more about discipline and improving curriculum and talking about teachers? So I'm gonna give you a shot now to lay out what is the conservative viewpoint inside of what we should be believing and working for within schools. But I also want you to talk about um, why does this need to be an either or? And does it need to be an either and or? Um, I mean, first off, you know, I love Checker dearly. But you know, we did seventy thousand words. I think that's beyond most people's attention span. And we have on every Very one of those. Very rarely do people say we want more. <laughs> <laughs> and on every one of those topics, I think Mike and I, you know, we addressed them all pretty forthrightly. Um, so sure. Uh, so you know, first off, great. I love when people are saying, "Well, what else can you tell me?" That's great. Um, but it's also the idea of writing. I think any volume uh, is to engage readers and move the conversation. Uh, I don't think Mike or I, for a moment, suggest. We either have the answer to what conservatives should embrace or the application for how each of these things should play out in 100,000 uh, schools or 6,000 colleges and universities. That's part of the beauty of the American system is there's lots of ways to apply these things in lots of places. Um, but look, more fundamentally, some of this is pretty straightforward. Um, I think one of the things Mike and I talk about is that, you know, that the, there, there's the real world in which decisions get made, and in that real world, there's always compromises. And that's natural and healthy. But I think one of the challenges for conservatives have been that in the compromises that have been made over, say, the last 25 years, uh, we frequently wound up not just compromising on tactics and particulars, but compromising on principle. So for a big one for me, for instance, is that when we talk about school discipline, um, there's questions about the fundamental problems with notions of restorative justice, with the way this stuff has been applied. Our colleague Max Eden has written elegantly about these questions. But there's also the fundamental question of are parents responsible for making their kids, making sure their kids behave? When I started in this stuff, when I taught high school in the 1990s, when I was training student teachers, um, there was too much emphasis on the role of the parent and not enough emphasis on the responsibilities of the educator. Um, it was good and healthy that we have learned to pay much more attention to insisting that educators not make excuses, not blame families. But conservatives stopped talking about the family role. I mean, it is hard to find even Republican officials, 
even, you know, outspoken, table-thumping Republicans who want to say parents should be taking away a kid, their kids' phones at 8 o'clock at night. Parents should be making watch, sure... Watch those... Virginia. <laughs> it's hard to find. I say it's impossible to find. Um, you know, it's hard to find folks who are saying, you know what? We've got to talk about parent rights to see those parents' right to see that curriculum, but we also got to talk about whether or not parents are making sure their kids are going to school. We've got to make sure parents are checking their kids' homework to make sure it's done. So for us, a lot of this is not just about the policies we embrace, but as we argue in the book, those policies need to be anchored in values and principles. And I fear that we made the mistake over the last 25 years of growing nervous, of growing hesitant to talk about principle. And now what we actually see is a problematic reaction formation the other way, where we've seen all of these performative online you know, pajama nut jobs on TikTok who want to launch kind of cultural grenades, but don't actually want to have a serious conversation about the responsibility side of the equation. Yeah, I'd say, like, and we have clear stuff in the book about thing, policy ideas for existing schools. We talk, we have a big section about teacher pay and how eliminating bureaucracy so we could pay teachers more. We have a lot about school discipline that's in there as well. But I think as Rick was saying, I mean, a big part of this is, and it's a tension, like when, when we're conservatives thinking about how policy is made, is that we have a bias towards localism, right? We want those 14,000 school districts or those 50 different states to create solutions that are right for them. So there's no book that we're going to write that says, well, this is the student discipline policy that all 100,000 schools should have. But what we can do is articulate these principles so that when that school board is meeting or when that state board of education is meeting or when those state legislators are meeting, they can have in their mind, okay, how should we be thinking about this problem? How can we solve this problem? What are the trade-offs that are inherent in all of that? Because, because of the peculiarities of all all of the different communities that exist in our country, they might come up with very different solutions that are still guided by those same principles. And so it's always tough when you're conservatives writing a book about education in America, people are like, well, you're not prescriptive enough. And it's like, well, that's because that's not really our thing. But then it's like, oh, well, you're too sort of foggy on the other side. But that's what we're trying to do is give these principles so that people can think through these problems when they're solving them in their own communities. I think I see a volume two coming even, so there we go. So, so I want to take us to higher education. So um, I think one of the most compelling uh, statements you make uh, in your section on higher ed is that you say that conservatives need to engage in higher education, not abandon it. And you also make it really clear that you think that there is an upcoming era where we need to launch new models and actually develop new colleges. Um, so I want to ask you to talk more about that given that we are entering or are in this great upheaval right now where we're having demographic cliffs, um, over half the country does not see value in a four-year degree right now, um, and we are also having a plethora of ways to deliver knowledge and skill development. So why is there a golden age of college around the corner, and what do you think the conservative values are there? Yes, I'll take the first half. You'll you'll get the second half. But part of it's of not not sort of making colleges the enemy or others. You know, one of the quotations that we use in the very beginning of the book when we're talking about what it means to be a conservative is a quote from the British philosopher Sir Roger Scruton, which I wish more Americans knew about Scruton. I think he's fantastic. He has a great book called How to Be Conservative. He has another book, What's a Conservatism, An Introduction to the Great Tradition. They're both very slim. They're good. But in his book, How to Be a, Conservatism, How to Be a Conservative, he says this great line that conservatism comes from a sentiment that all adults readily share, and that's that good things are difficult to build but easy to destroy. Um, and I think when I look at higher education, like I'm from the Midwest, right? So I'm from, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. And when I would travel west on I-70 to go out, you know, snowboarding in, in Colorado or whatever, as you're going across the Great Plains there, there's a whole lot of nothing. But after about, you know, 40 minutes or so outside of Kansas City, rising up on this hill off to the left side is this massive complex. You're like, what the hell is that? Oh, that's the University of Kansas that folks, because of the Land Grant Act and others, created these institutions 100, 150 years ago. You keep going a little bit farther, again, you're in the middle of farmland, but what rises off to the right in Manhattan, Kansas? Kansas State, right? These incredible institutions. And the thing is, like, you cannot just make out of whole cloth 150-year-old institutions. 
you know, whatever, how old is Harvard? 380 years or something? You can't just make new 380 year institutions. And so part of being a conservative, when Rick will do great things talking about all the new things that we need to, to create, but you can't just abandon those types of places. And it will be difficult, and it's an uphill battle, and you're outnumbered, and all of those things that are true. But there's certain facets of that, and there's certain capital that exists there, deep wells that have been dug over hundreds of years, that you can't just start anew. So those, you know, our land-grant universities and others are such a great testament to the American ingenuity. And many of the great institutions that exist now were from a kind of previous age of creation that existed. But those are still worthy of our affection. They're still worthy of our support. It ain't easy, but it's something that we still need to be committed to trying to turn around. Yeah, you know, I mean, Mike's, Mike's Catholic, so this is easy for him to kind of separate the sin from the sinner. <laughs> and I think... You know, when you look at these institutions, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the uh, legacies, the alumni networks, the influence, the reputation, the resources, uh, these are remarkable agglomerations. Um, and the fact that they have been currently seized by folks who are hostile to the, 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 the formative mission of the institution people for whom the guiding principle is not of free inquiry or of sharing the good and the beautiful or the pursuit of truth, but for whom it is about politics and ideology. That is a profound problem and one that it is, I think, you know, for me, heartwarming to see conservatives unapologetically calling this out and pushing back. I thought the December 5th hearing in Washington, D.C., despite the coverage in the mainstream media and the education press was one of the highlights of my professional career. I thought the questions asked by the members of the House were powerful and important, and they had the appropriate consequences for the presidents of UPenn and Harvard. Um, but that's not enough. It's got to be what are we for? What do we want these institutions to be? Because I think the, the, the sad truth is Mike and I get enough emails from faculty friends who feel held hostage at these elite institutions, that they're like, you will never believe what I saw at this meeting. Or, Rick, you would be the only person to believe. Because the reality is that it's not like most faculty at the Ivies um, have bought into political and social agendas. The problem is that folks with undue influence and power, internally and externally, have bought into these things and are browbeating. Um, I think lots of people who want to take the work of the institution seriously. And so part of our mission as conservatives is to liberate them, to set them free, to change the paradigm. One way we do that is by making sure we fight for the health of those institutions and to liberate them. A second, though, is to say that, look, we have gotten into this unusual, uh, in, into this problematic habit of imagining that we, the only universities we need are the ones we happen to have today. Well, this was not always so. For a long time in America, for the whole of the 19th century, we had a proud tradition of institution formation. We launched close to 1,000 colleges and universities, most of them private, in the course of the 19th century. Over half of today's top 20 institutions, including places like Hopkins and Stanford and University of Rochester, were formed in that era. What's happened, though, is we've gotten out of that habit. Even conservatives, with a lot of money to give, wind up giving it to where they went to school. Or want to give it to, or write a big bribe, tax tax supported bribe, mm -hmm. to an institution that they hope will admit their kid or grandkid. Uh, they give it to famous schools. This has been, and what's happened, therefore, is all of these resources have flown to an existing apparatus that no longer serves our purpose. Well, look, what's changed? The universities and colleges, and even our more recent community college system, were an answer to a particular problem. It was when it was hard to get books hard to get people together with a professor, hard to find space where people could learn. Today, those are the easiest things in the world. The challenge today is to make sure that people have actually learned what they were supposed to learn, to actually offer a coherent and lucid uh, program of study. These are things that universities and even community colleges actually do pretty poorly. So it's not like we lose anything by exploring new models, by steering these funds into folks who are figuring out new ways to do this work. The University of Austin is one high-profile example. If you're not familiar with Minerva in the San Francisco Bay Area, in which students spend college in six or seven different continents, uh, six different continents, I believe, right, over the course of their four years, uh, remarkable kind of exploration of the liberal arts. These are things that we ought to be looking into. 
and 100 more models besides for everything from coding boot camps to elite research institutions. Great. I know we have five minutes. I'm going to be really fast. I've got two quick questions. One is um, the section that I want to talk to you the most about over a drink, and maybe we'll do it after this, uh, is on early childhood. You make statements about you know, three principles for conservatives um, are about uh, for the purpose of early childhood education, to provide relief for working families, keeping kids connected to families, and maintaining a supportive array of learning environments. I agree with all those. But I also believe, as a huge advocate of, of quality early childhood, is we've also got to prepare kids to be ready for success in school. And so talk to me about why that wasn't included. And I have all kinds of things I want to tell you why I think it should be, but I want to hear from you all. Well, I think it's, a, it's sort of implicitly included, because what we're talking about is trying to find these environments that are um, not as sort of centrally controlled. Uh, and some of it we're, we're responding that there was, you know, um, some of our friends on the left when they talk about early childhood education are oftentimes just talking about sort of appending another year or two onto K-12 education. And part of what we see is there's lots of these private providers that are already in that space. And there's also other sort of adjacent types of institutions where we don't have to even think about them in the same way of the way classes are organized or others. So I think that school readiness is important. But, but look, I, part of it is I wonder sometimes if the sort of school readiness tail wags the dog of early childhood education. One of the stories that we tell in the book, it was actually, I think, here at AEI, we were at an event, and I, maybe some of y'all have, if you have young kids that are in, in preschool or something right now, you know, you get the note home at the end of the day that's like 40 different data points of like, we did standard 40.1 or whatever. And I mean, my reaction to that is like, that kind of sounds dystopian and terrible, right? Like, there are three like, like, so I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you on school preparedness and things, but I wonder if we've kind of overcorrected in that area, and we're not preparing kids for school across all these other dimensions that are really important around self-regulation and discipline and, and, and respect and all of that sort of stuff, because we're really super into these particular um, academic indicators. So I think we maybe have this kind of holistic picture. I don't know if you're the same on that one. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I partly, um, I think, again, to Mike's point, mostly I think what we're pushing back against is Bill de Blasio's, you know, uh, landmark expansion of early childhood uh, was putting four-year-olds in big, kind of decrepit institutional buildings uh, for 180 days a year and shipping those kids home at 2 o'clock, whether or not the parents' workday was actually done it to, uh, which strikes us as bizarrely institutional, impersonal, and inconvenient. And so what we're actually asking is, are there ways for those of us not in the pocket of the teacher unions uh, to offer better, more agile, more family-friendly alternatives? And we think there are. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to hold my last question for the drink afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, I want to end because I want to keep us on time. Uh, just with a thank you at where I started. Um, you know, being now in the arena as a policymaker, it is amazing to see so often how there is not values-based leadership. And I happen to believe that there is a huge uh, vacuum of leadership right now in education, people willing to stand up for anything and especially to stand up for what they believe in. And what I hope with this book, what I hope happens, is that it inspires more people to actually grapple with what they believe in. And on this note, the piece that I was most heartened with is that every single thing you talk about is centered on students. And too often today, the conversations that we're having in education talk about so many other things, but don't actually talk about what we should be talking about, which is students. And how does this policy or this practice actually support student learning, student achievement, student well-being? And so I want to thank you for putting a pin strongly in the conversation that it matters to believe in something, and we need to believe in our kids. So thank you for doing that, and I look forward to continuing the conversation, uh, not just here at AI, but also one of the things I hope everyone does um, is not just clap right now for these two for authoring this, but going out, getting this book, and then having the conversation around your dinner tables, having the conversation in your classes, um, and talk to your neighbors about this, because this is what matters so much, is to have the conversation about what we believe in and how do we make sure that we're living our values every single day as we fight for a better education system. So thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thanks.
Nuru, uh, editor of National Review magazine and columnist uh, for the Washington Post. We have Matt Connetti, uh, author of The Right, uh, The History of Contemporary Conservatism in the U.S. And if you haven't read it, it is a book you really uh, will find worth the reading, uh, as well as the Chief of Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And we have Ian Rowe, uh, Senior Fellow at AEI, uh, and author of Agency. Um, hey, great to have all of you with us. Uh, with that, um, Matt, I'm going to ask you actually to kick us off as the guy, you, you, I want this conversation in particular, Mike and I just spent a lot of time talking a little more granularly about educational questions. I want to make sure now we're thinking more broadly about the relationship of education and the right. And Matt, I, I'd, I'd like you to kick us off. You know, as you talk about at length in your book, um, William F. Buckley, in many ways, uh, founded the uh, American, uh, uh, the, the contemporary American conservative movement. Uh, and of course, the book that launched him into preeminence was Got a Man at Yale, um, in which he talked about what his concerns about higher education and what it meant for the nation more broadly. Kind of curious, from where you sit at this point, where, is, where, how have we gotten here in terms of the conservative relationship to education, and how is education factored in as we look back in the history of American conservatism? Well, uh, thank you, Rick, and it's great to be here and to be a part of this event and your book launch uh, with Mike. It's a great book. I recommend it to everybody. You know, as you mentioned, um, the relationship between American conservatism and American education, K through 12 and higher ed, is uh, very uh, integral. And in many ways, the story of the American conservative movement in the 20th and 21st centuries is the story of attempts to address problems or perceived problems in the education system. And that was even before William F. Buckley Jr. published his famous book, God and Man at Yale, in 1951. One can look at some of the antecedents to the American conservative movement in the 1920s and 30s. Figures like Albert J. Nock, figures like Paul Elmer Moore and Irving Babbitt. And you can see in their texts, in their writing, a deep concern with education. What's interesting is that uh, their take on the education system was very elitist and very skeptical or critical of small d democracy. And so these pre-World War II thinkers on the right were very much in the, uh, of the belief that um, education was not for everyone, that you needed to educate an elite, a natural aristocracy in Jeffersonian terms, or some type of um, uh, leader or elite that will emerge. And that, that, those are the people to whom education should be addressed. What's interesting about post-war American conservatism is the broadening of concern among conservatives to include all Americans and a, a small d democratization of the idea of education. And so when I think about the history of education and the right over the last 75 years or so, I think it really takes two, uh, two parts. It's form and substance. And so there have been major debates and concerns over the form or the structure of education and there have been major debates and concerns over the substance or the content of education. So when we think of form or structure, we think of other debates over choice, over charter schools, whether we should have a Department of Education at all, what should be the relationship between the federal uh, government and state and local education departments be? Should we expand homeschool options? Who sits on our school boards? All of these concerns are with the form or the structure of education, how education is delivered to students. And they've been dominant throughout, um, but also sometimes fade in importance. If you think about the, uh, the 20 years in between um, Reagan's election in 1980 and uh, George W. Bush's election in 2000, you see that uh, form was slightly diminished. Right? Reagan came into office thinking, well, we're going to end the Department of Education. He couldn't do it. And in fact, his second 
Education Secretary, William J. Bennett, was responsible for shifting the focus of conservative educational thought and action toward the substance of the education, talking about character education. How do we build character? What are the values and morals we're teaching to students? Talking about curriculum. What are we teaching? Not just in elementary school, but also in higher ed. That's the beginning of our debates over political correctness happening at the tail end of the Reagan era. And then when we get to the Bush administration, of course, it's about accountability. It's about standards, right? So just to close, when I think of the right now in education, I see a heavy stress on form and structure. I see a lot of efforts being put into the educational freedom movement, into expanding options, into um, combating the public sector unions. I think a lot of that may be the result of the pandemic, like Mike was mentioning in the earlier panel. But I'm also beginning to see, especially on the state level, efforts to address substance, efforts to go after the curriculum, efforts to talk about what materials are available to, say, students in early childhood up to third grade. And the real question will be, what is the agenda that the right puts forward in the next uh, presidential administration or in the next Congress? Is it going to be some mix of form or content? Is it going to be weighted more heavily to another, uh, to one or the other? Uh, but I think fundamentally you have to address both, just as the tradition of American conservatism has addressed both. Thanks, Matt. Well, Matt, from where you sit, especially the approach at National Review, you have a broad sense of the political landscape, of you know, the, the panoply of domestic policy issues. Where, where, does conservative, well, where, where does education sit in there right now? How much energy, attention does it feel like it's getting versus, say, five or ten years ago? And how much of that attention feels like it's productive or principled versus more, something more performative? Well, I think that um, there's an enormous amount of energy and excitement in states and localities surrounding school choice um, because we've just had this huge expansion uh, particularly in 22 and 2023, um, those are the best years that school choice has had uh, so far. So it's not surprising that um, that people sort of feel like they are pushing on an open door. Um, at the same time, I think because of that excitement, conservatives do run the risk of losing sight of the fact that you know something like 90% of American school kids attend public school and that that number is, is going to change only at the margin even as um, school choice continues to succeed. Uh, and so I'm seeing um, maybe a little bit less attention than I would like to see on uh, what we can do as conservatives uh, to support the public schools and to make public schooling better. Um, with that said, you are also seeing debates. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about the sometimes heated and sometimes shedding more heat than light debate over um, critical race theory um, is that it really has put at the forefront some important questions about the teaching of history. Um, I don't know that we have yet gotten a popular, compelling answer that both acknowledges the country's tarnished history, but also its glorious history. Um, but I think that, that those sorts of things are also really important, and we shouldn't sidestep them in favor of an exclusive focus on things like school choice. You know, uh, last week, Tucker Carlson obviously went to, to Russia to, you know, to teach us how much better Moscow is than any American city. And it's got grocery scores, and it's got grocery carts, all kinds of stuff. Um, I mean, when we talk about history and the relative, you know, and, and, and kind of the America's role in the world, one of the things that I think, you know, I, I've always taken for granted is that there was a whole wing of the campus left um, that you know, idolized Howard Zinn and despised America. Um, it feels now, obviously, that there are elements in the populist right who have made this bipartisan. How does that complicate efforts to think about kind of a true history that, uh, you know, is uh, open-eyed about both America's virtues and flaws? Well, we have to acknowledge that coin-operated shopping carts are the pinnacle of civilization. Eh? <laughs> a reliable marker of a high-trust society. Um, 
You know, I think that uh, it's important um, to restate American principles um, and their inclusiveness uh, because you, we are seeing a turn against them um, on the left and on the right. I don't think it's a turn that has uh, pulled in most of the U.S. population, however, uh, and I think we do always have to keep in mind that there is, you know, a large population of normal people, even if they do not always make themselves heard online, uh, and uh, and stand for those people, um, because the uh, the alternatives are are far inferior and sometimes crazy, um, maybe even in the clinical sense. <laughs> you know, Ian, one of the things that this all brings up is something that Amy asked about in the first panel, is this relationship between values and practice or policy of education. I mean, you're somebody who has run schools that were unapologetically um, you know, immersed in teaching kids um, about virtue and the success sequence. You've got a lot of scars to show for that experience. How do you think about where we have gotten that balance wrong in terms of thinking both about value and practice or policy, and what does it look like to get it right? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. You know, I, I agree a lot with um, uh, Matt and Ramesh. It, it might be that our focus as conservatives, from policy perspective, on things like choice and accountability, have overshadowed in many ways. Um, the virtues conversation, which I'm like, very excited to talk about. And it might be that we're actually victims of our own success. You know, on the accountability front, obviously no child, no child left behind. Every state is obsessed with standardized test scores. But it's almost led to a perverse response uh, in terms of accountability. I mean, just a couple of months ago, the New Jersey State Board of Education, because they were unsatisfied with the demographic makeup of the kids that were demonstrating proficiency for to leave high school, you know, only 39% of kids uh, demonstrated proficiency, and they were dissatisfied with, um, you know, black and Hispanic students. So what did they do? They just they just ch changed the cut score. You know, they just changed the proficiency level, and now close to 80% of kids are, you know, voila, you know, student achievement. So. So there's been this sort of perverse response to accountability. And on the school choice front, you know, as Ramesh just said, I mean, this is a golden era for school choice. I mean, more than 30 plus states have some version of ESAs, charter schools, vouchers. But it's not great if you now have choice, but most of your choices are schools that are either ideologically immersed in things like uh, equity and DEI or anti-racism or they're having privilege walks. And so I think what's now starting to happen, which I think is good, is that based on what we've been, achieve, been able to achieve on the policy front, how can we actually now start getting back to things like core virtues? There's a reason the classical education movement, I think, has had such a... Um, huge resounding um, resurgence, I guess, in the last few years, because I think a lot of parents and students just want to go to schools that are focused on core values. I mean, we just launched our high school in the Bronx, and we are organized around the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. And, and that, or, that affects every aspect of our curriculum, the canon, the reward system, and we have I statements associated with each of the, the cardinal virtues. So courage, for example, and these are words that all of our students have to memorize. But courage is I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of uncertainty and struggle. Like those are words that our, our kids learn and master. Temperance, you know, I lead my life with self-discipline because I am responsible for my learning and my behavior. These are powerful words and messages that first kids learn in their head, but ultimately they learn it in their, in their heart, and they adopt that behavior. And I think 
I think there's something very powerful, especially in the face of a lot of the equity conversations and your, your value is you know, determined based on your skin color. No, 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 I think a lot of people want to reject that and get back to the inherent dignity of each individual, the common humanity. And that's what virtues-based schools and values-based schools are all about. So I think that's, that's part of the answer. And one other thing I want to say, because we haven't really talked about it, we talked a little bit higher ed, you know, the Wall Street Journal has a great story today. Uh, uh, Burning Glass just put out a really interesting study that says that nearly 50% of college graduates 10 years later are in jobs that don't require a college degree. Like, think about that. That's amazing, right? Um, and so the implication for me, and again, something we're doing at our high school, is that we're embedding apprenticeships and internships during the junior and senior year so that you can earn uh, industry credentials with labor market value. So it may be that at the end of high school, college shouldn't be the only immediate option uh, that we're pushing most kids to do. Instead, maybe there are opportunities in certain industries where you can work for a few years before you go back to college if that's what you so choose. So these are the kinds of things I think when we're now talking about the substance of what kids are actually doing in school. Virtues-based education, more multiple pathways in the secondary experience. Those are the kinds of things I think um, are on the horizon and what we should be for versus just against. Amy, you know, one of the things that that, that, that suggests is, you know, if we're going to be for empowering parents and giving families more options among schools and giving them more options of good programs against them, that's great. I mean, I think, but I think that's a pretty easy yes. You know, one of the questions I think that's often asked is, okay, what are you going, what are you, what are you, you being us conservatives, going to do about um, good, reliable early childhood options? Going to be about what happens actually inside schools? Going to be about affordable or accountable higher ed? So, you know, you spent a lot of years trying to help states build out data systems to look at these things. And now you spent the last several years working with Governor Yunkin to try to tackle some of these. Curious, what are some of the, opportunities, the low-hanging fruit that you see kind of where you're sitting, especially given that you have, in your role, you touch the early childhood and K-12 and higher ed systems in Virginia. And where, where are those opportunities and where are some of the pain points in kind of moving on that? So I say the lowest hanging fruit and the most important thing that we can do, all of us, is to remind people what, what your book says, is to remind people what we believe in. And what Governor Yunkin came into office and what he did on the campaign trail is that he had the audacity to remind people um, that we need to restore excellence to education. And I would argue that that is the most important message that we can all give, is that our children deserve to have high expectations of them, and the adults in the system, all of us, need to be held accountable for actually meeting students where they are and getting them where they need to go. That is a very simple premise. It's one that we used to take for granted that all kids can learn. And it's one now that we keep changing everything, thinking, oh, it's too hard. It makes them feel bad. And so we're in a position in Virginia where, much like the New Jersey State Board did, we're living and reaping the horrific results of having a culture of insidious lowering of expectations. And guess what? A system gets the results for which it's built. And so the easiest thing we can do, the most important low-hanging fruit is to remind people that we know what it looks like when we have high expectations for every child at every level and that we make sure we meet them where we are. And so that's why in Virginia, under Governor Yunkin, everything we do is focused on that. And we have three, three purposes of education, right? It is, and it's, again, part of your book. One is to prepare people for success and to be a productive member of the economy. One is to be an informed member of a, our democracy. And one is to be an engaged member of our communities. Those are values-based statements about what we believe in and why they matter. Um, but it's about providing that transparency of where every student is, it's making sure that we also show where it's working and where it's not working, and that we create a demand for things that work because we do know what works. We have evidence across this country, and it's again why it's important to gather in these rooms and learn from each other. And it's to create an appetite to say, how do we show that this one-size-fits-all system, whether it be in early childhood, whether it be in K-12, whether it be in higher education, 
is not working for the vast majority of our students? And how do we encourage a spirit of innovation at all levels to make sure that we are creating the learning opportunities that our children deserve at all levels um, and that we make it possible to unleash that energy and that innovation to get different results um, because they deserve it. So I could go on for miles about every single one of them, um, but the things that we're doing is reminding people through transparency and data. For example, and Ramesh, I would say that we do have an example, I'd like to say in Virginia, that I think we do have the nation's best history and civic standards now, where we're able to tell the good and the bad and to also inspire. And so I invite everyone to look at those history standards. You might have heard that there was some conversation about them. Um, but they're really, really good. And by the time we leave office, we will have raised expectations of all of our students in Virginia in history and civics and English and math and in science and in computer science. And Governor Yunkin just asked us to expedite some more of those because the first step is to say what we believe. And what we believe is that we are not asking enough of our students. The second step is to say, how do we have better information and how do we empower everyone, students, parents, and teachers, and the public with information about how well our schools at all level are serving. And then three, how do we make sure that people have quality options that they can take care of, it, whether it be in early childhood, college, or K-12? Um, and in early childhood, I'm proud to say in Virginia, we have one of the greatest public-private choice systems that exists. We just launched a campaign called Building Blocks um, for Families in Virginia in December. Um, with the funding cliff coming, with the recovery with dollars going, you know, we're able to transition and make sure that not a single child will lose services. And at the same time, we are committed to anywhere that there's public dollars being spent, that we also will have quality options for families that they get to choose, whether it's at a home-based care, whether it's in a public school, or whether it is in a church basement. But what we're doing is empowering families with good information, quality options, and accountability for results. And that, to me, is a concern conservative is what we need to do at every point in our education system. You know, Matt, well, the, this tension you alluded to um, between kind of a, a, the aristocracy uh, of merit and the small d democracy um, shows up in a lot of these things. For instance, in, in the choice conversation, uh, one of the things we know from the research, uh, including from Mike's team at EdChoice, is that when you ask families what do they focus on when they're picking a good school, they don't necessarily focus on the things that the folks building the accountability systems want them to focus on. Test scores tend to come in 15th, 20th, among all the criteria. What One argument is that the parents are wrong. Another argument is that parents actually don't think those test scores are as telling as other things they care about. When we think about kind of these tensions of how do you build systems that are responsive to what consumers or parents want, um, but you're also spending public funds through public entities. Has, has our thinking on how we wrestle with these changed over time? Is this, is this a new dilemma that's due to the way we're thinking about operating schools, or is this something that we can look to antecedents? Well, I think it's uh, become more complex, and it also relates to other developments on the right in terms of the judiciary and the conservative legal movement. So when Milton Friedman proposes the idea of school choice in capitalism and freedom in 1962, um, it is, of course, a very marginal idea. It has to fight its way into the center of education discourse even before it can be implemented as public policy. And when conservatives are in a position to begin implementing it as in public policy in the 80s and the 90s, it immediately runs up against judicial opposition, especially the idea of taxpayer dollars being spent to uh, religious educational institutions. But because of similar developments within the conservative legal movement and some original thinking in the public policy world, it's become much easier now to, for us to provide parents with a variety of options. And that's why we've seen this ex incredible growth in the educational freedom movement in just the past several years. So the, the fundamental tension, though, about, well, w what are conservatives for? What is the, what, and what should conservatives think about government's role in education? That hasn't changed. That hasn't, <laughs> that hasn't really been resolved. And when I think about recent developments in the rights thinking about education, you see the turn toward a more um, anti-elitist populism 
toward a great suspicion of bigness and big institutions. And there the turn was really visible with the Common Core debate during the Obama era, where suddenly you would go to these Tea Party rallies and what the man dressed as the colonial patriot wanted to talk about wasn't Obamacare anymore. It was about Common Core, and it was about Bill Gates's plan to corrupt our children through the education system. And so that became, I think, a spur toward a f- renewed focus on structure as opposed to content, but it also was emblematic of a shift on the right toward an anti-elitism, a suspicion of expert opinion, and the sense that we don't want the government telling, stu- uh, telling schools what to teach. I think we've come to maybe regret that a little bit um, in the wake of 2020 and in the wake of uh, the revelation that many parents experienced about the ways in which social justice ideology has been in incorporated into school curriculum. And so now we see a renewed emphasis on, well, how do, we, how do we correct for that? So it is very much a pendulum, I would say, that swings back and forth, uh, contingent on, uh, on events and contingent, as always, on what the left does. The right is always responding to the left. And so as the left changes, then the right has to rethink and renew and reform. You know, Ramesh, this is, you know, in light of what Matt just said, I mean, it's an interesting question. When we look at the Common Core, and you, <laughs> I remember talking to you at various points through that in, entire episode, is that something in retrospect that's a case of the right effectively rising up, or is this something that the right ought to regret? What, what are the takeaways from that experience? So I, I think that the main takeaway is not so much about the right or the left, it's about the institutional setup of American K-12 to education, which just does not lend itself to national overhauls, uh, however well or ill-conceived. Um, and I think that one of, the, so one of the things I like about this book is if you look at the index, the Department of Education comes up exactly one time. Um, and I think that that is an accurate depiction of its place in the national educational landscape. I'd prefer better federal education policy. I'd prefer less federal education policy, frankly. Um, but I think that things like getting hung up on the department and and trying to get rid of it even are uh, in many ways a distraction from what an, what a sensible education agenda could be. And I think that conservatives, liberals, everybody is putting more focus on what goes on in localities because that's where the action is. You, you, the federal government just um, provides too small a share of the funding of American education for it to drive the train. When it tries to do it, what it mainly finds is that states and localities get very creative in undermining and getting around those strictures. Now, the, the exception to that, obviously, is higher ed. Exactly, yes. K-12 to is, is very different. It's, it's so, and, and I'm curious. So, so, you know, the dilemma arises in light, uh, you know, Casual observers may not realize that the Biden administration is continuing to pursue loan forgiveness through different statutory, uh, attempting different statutory loopholes than it tried when it got shot down at the Supreme Court last year. They've put through new regulations on income-driven repayment, which was supposed to be a fair shake for taxpayers and borrowers. It's going to cost taxpayers $500 billion over the next 10 years. Um, the, you know, there's two impulses for conservatives if a conservative were to take, you know, if there was a conservative in a position of responsibility in 2025, one is to say we don't want to do too much out of Washington, and the other is that we have to correct this stuff. How do we think about kind of the right response to that tension? I, I think that w- you can correct a lot of things. The, the federal government should be undoing damaging things that it does, uh, or at least making its policies better, it just shouldn't have this idea that it's going to revolutionize and improve American education centrally, because that's that's just not going to happen, and the attempt to pursue that goal is going to waste a lot of time and energy and probably produce other kinds of perverse consequences. Ian, um, you know, you sit on a school board, in addition to everything else you do. Um, you know, no man gets enough punishment in his life, so bless you. Um, <laughs> You know, wearing that hat, I mean, part of this conversation, you know, we're in a D.C. think tank, so 
there's a tendency to talk about national policy, whether or not it's a useful response to the challenge at hand. Um, but when we think particularly about, you know, 14,000 school boards, about the way these debates are playing out, what are conservatives and, you know, again, anybody who's fighting for some of these really broadly shared values, the idea that excellence is a good thing, that it's a mistake for California to try to eliminate um, advanced math classes for kids in grades 1 to 10, uh, the idea that it's not racist to ask kids to show their work in math. Um, some of these things which seem broadly, broadly well-received, but in school districts, they've become remarkably controversial in many cases. How can parents or educators or citizens engage in a way that's going to feel um, constructive and actually move the ball forward? Yeah, good. Uh, 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 two things. One is just on, quickly on the Federal Department of Education. If, if, if one does, if a department does have to exist, we should figure out <laughs> what, is, what is the right role for it. So, for example, shouldn't there be disincentives to New Jersey for just simply lowering their proficiency score, the governor of Oregon on a late Friday night saying it's no longer necessary to take the, the high school exam to, to be able to graduate. So we should figure out what the federal department, if it has to exist, what it should do uh, proactively. Um, um, and as far as running, uh, so yes, I ran for the local school board in my own hometown because we started to see that we were not focusing on excellence and there was, uh, you know, all sorts of activities around equity, and and it was it was actually it's a great laboratory of democracy because at the local level, at least at our school board, it's not so much about conservative versus progressive. It's about what works for our kids. We're we're neighbors, you know, you know. There's a lot of um, issues, for example, around transgender ideology right now. And a few months ago, we had a. Uh, a thirteen-year-old girl in a female locker room uh, at a uh, you know at an athletic event, and suddenly a guy walks in, and that was problematic. And so this girl walks out, and and the feedback that she got is that well, this guy thinks that he uh, is of a different gender, and so your options were to you know go change in the stall. But when most parents heard about that, they said. That doesn't make sense. We can be sensitive to the the concerns of this uh, man, but maybe there are other solutions like creating private uh, changing areas. I use it as a, a simple example, but it didn't become this huge um, battle ideologically. It's just what's the practical solution for our kids? And that's why education is so powerful, because I think once you get closer to in neighborhoods, what works for kids, what do parents want, um, you know, most parents are choosing schools based on safety, right? Geographical proximity, you know, is, are the teachers decent? Um, so I think sometimes we get so caught up in a lot of the political ideology, we forget that most parents just want their kids to have a good shot at a good, decent education. You know, and Ian, a couple times you've mentioned equity, mm. sounding like it's, uh, uh, you know, like, well, you flagged it as a problematic thing. Are you anti-equity? W what do you mean by that? Well, equity in practice, like the, 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 um, the folks, the proponents of equity will usually use the definition like, well, equity, equity is just every kid gets what they need, right? That's a very benign, soft uh, definition when truly that's what equality of opportunity means. That's, equality of opportunity means you get differentiated instruction or supports so that you can now compete on an equal playing field, right? That's what equality of opportunity is. In practice, equity typically means you're no longer looking at students as individuals, you're just looking at them as avatars of their race. So you know when, when you know that you're fighting for equity because there's inequity uh, between uh, different demographic groups, right? So if there's uh, differences between the reading scores for black students and white students, that difference must be due to structural racism. And so therefore, uh, we need some top-down solution that creates equity, that, that forces, that levels the playing field. I mean, in San Diego, this literally happened. Um, they did an analysis and they found that 20% of black students were, got failing grades in San Diego, 7% of white students got 
failing grades. And rather than look at the performance of the 80% of black students that were doing passing or the 93% of white students that were passing, they said that 13 percentage point difference means structural racism. And we got to look at these black kids. They can't do homework. You know, their lives are so terrible. So guess what? In the name of equity, let's just remove the requirement to submit homework on time for all 110,000 kids in the San Diego school system. So typically, an equity mindset is usually one focused on leveling the playing field or leveling group outcomes in such a way in which you're diminishing standards. Um, you're not treating folks as individuals. It leads to things like, let's just eliminate the, the Bill de Blasio in New York wanting to eliminate the specialized high school exams. It's absolutely horrible for most children. Amy, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the call for equity is something that we see in every state, state equity plans and the rest, uh, Federal Department of Education, directives on this. Be curious to your thoughts. But also, you know, one of the things you talk about is the need for excellence and rigor. Um, we talk about this frequently in K-12. In college, for instance, not everybody is aware that we actually have many of the same challenges. Uh, stu you know, uh, the folks who study this, the survey data suggests that students are only doing about half as much work as they were 30, 40, 30 or 40 years ago in college, full-time students. Students are also working less while they're in college. Um, we've also seen massive grade inflation in college. So you see less work, higher grades, uh, the anecdotal accounts from professors about the difficulty of setting expectations or demanding on-time work just fill up the chronicle of higher ed or inside higher ed. When you look at the Virginia University system, which is nationally renowned, mm -hmm. are these problems in evidence? How do you go about addressing them? Uh, so part of the reason I love this job that I'm in <clears throat> is that I get to work in the whole system because these are related issues <clears throat> across K-12 and, um, and post-secondary. Because we've lowered our standards, <clears throat> our kids are not ready to go on and do college level work, and yet we have now changed all of our admissions requirements in the name of equity. And so we have tons of people going through our college systems that are actually not capable of doing college level work, and yet in the name of everybody having a fair shot, we're doing that, and we're pouring millions, if not billions of dollars into then trying to do remediation at age 20, 21, 22, 28, rather than doing the hard work when we should be doing it, which is in early childhood education and in elementary school. And if we would focus on that, that is a core principle for me, is let's do this smart and do it the right way, and it's the right way for everybody. But what we're seeing is we're trying, again, to have more transparency about what's happening. So a couple things. We, the governor meets every single, and I meet every single quarter with all of our um, uh, 15 presidents of our four years and uh, representatives of our 23 community colleges. That's never been done before. And part of it is a CEO to CEO conversation and saying, our college system really matters to prepare a vi people for a vibrant Virginia and that we have to get this right. Um, and we know we also need to be the leading state. Our goal is for attracting, growing, and retaining talent because we all know the race for talent is on, and so we're going to grow our own. So we have a really strong system. Um, that being said, this great upheaval is, is happening, and there's going to be a lot of change. And I think that Virginia is in a really strong position to take on that change. So we are embracing transparency and accountability in a whole new way in higher education. One of the calls that the governor has made to all the presidents is for them to play a more active role and to take it on as part of their mission to work in partnership with K-12 to ensure that they are doing work in partnership to prepare students to actually get into their institutions to do college level work. That sounds like that should not be revolutionary, and yet it is. Um, and I'll throw out one statistic. In Virginia, and this is Chev Data, our State Council of Higher Education, 10% of our first year students in our colleges, in our public colleges, do not persist on to second year. Of those 10% of students that don't persist, 40% of them have debt of $10,000 or more. Just think about that life-changing debt as an 18-year-old and 19-year-old. That's immoral. We are lying to people about their readiness, and I would claim we've been doing this in education at all levels. We are letting people in that, and telling them that they'll be ready and they'll catch up when they won't. And then we are saddling them with debt 
and with lost opportunity. And that is the exact opposite of what we should be doing with education. So what we're trying to do in Virginia is to get greater transparency. We are trying to very much bring back definitions of and an applauding of merit and saying we are going to start asking our institutions to start using measures of, of college readiness. It matters to actually say and to send a message throughout the system that it, hard work matters and excellence matters and achievement matters and that we're gonna make sure we're signaling that at every single point and working together. We also are gonna rethink all of our advanced um, work in gifted and talented programs. We're following what Fordham Institute's done with their great work on gifted and talented and making sure that also our colleges are working in partnership with our school divisions to do a better job of identifying students who have traditionally have not been identified as being capable of doing more advanced er earlier on so that we make sure that our Virginia institutions look like Virginia, not because we've changed the goalposts, but because our students are ready for the rigor of college work. And my last thing I'll say is, um, and no one that knows me will be surprised, we took a compliance exercise called the six-year planning process in higher education, which traditionally has just been really a big fancy way to create a biennium budget for higher education. Um, and we turned it into a true strategic planning process where um, we literally created data packs of all the publicly available data about what's happening in our colleges, every one of our institutions. And so I invite you to go onto the State Council for Higher Education uh, website and you can look and see an overview of where Virginia is in a comparable way across every one of our institutions on inputs in terms of looking at the changes in cost, the cost that is being spent on administration, what's being spent uh, in the classroom, but also in my mind equally if not more important on outcomes. For the first time ever you can go onto a single website in Virginia and find out the top 20 programs of study in every single institution and find out what percentage of students are getting jobs in the industry for which they prepared, at what way Age level over 10 years time, but also how the labor market in Virginia values the, um, the, the graduates of that program. We're trying to do a better job of create of really reinforcing the connection between earning and learning. Um, and as I said earlier, it's not just about getting a job. There's a lot of other good things we can talk about in terms of free inquiry and democracy and civics and all those things. But one of the key things is we're not preparing people well. The, the, the overproduction of degrees and folks that don't have those and aren't in jobs that require them, we've got to talk about this because the debt levels are huge and the amount of money we're spending on higher education and not getting the results that our, our, our Commonwealth deserves and our states deserve is a major, major issue. Ramesh, you, you, uh, our colleague Yuval Levin did a terrific National Review piece probably last year uh, on how the right what would do well to think about itself as a party of parents. You've written about, uh, you know, the, the, the promise of new programs being launched at state universities, uh, new centers for study of virtues and civics and Western Civ. When you think about what it looks like to put stuff forward other than abolishing the Department of Ed, what are three or four ideas that feel like they have traction, that they actually could go somewhere that they could actually make a difference and start of change, starting to change some of the, root, the expectations and norms? Well, the, uh, the simplest way to get that is just flip randomly through the pages of the book, uh, and you'll, you'll find um, such ideas. I do think that um, the idea of creating new centers in universities to try to disrupt the ideological monoculture that too many universities have become uh, is a promising one. We are seeing that effort take off as well. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense than the idea of trying to sort of regulate faculty behavior so that they will um, sort of, you know, provide multiple points of view when they're all overwhelmingly on one side of these debates. Uh, I'm not saying that such regulations are always wrong, um, but I just don't think that this is a strategy that can actually work. Um, I do think that the, that the, the school choice uh, efforts that are, be, that, are, that are underway in different states, I don't mean to um, suggest that, the, that I don't share um, the enthusiasm uh, for those efforts. Um, because I do think that there is a kind of sclerotic um, tendency in the public schools that has to be taken on. But more broadly, I just think that there's an opportunity that was brought to us by this horrible plague of COVID um, that, has, that has opened up possibities, uh, partly by shaking people out 
of complacency about the school system. People saw, uh, got, a, got a better, parents got a better look inside the schools uh, and what was happening in them than the, they had previously had. And uh, a lot of people saw that um, these systems were not built to prioritize the needs of students and parents, um, but they were responding to other priorities entirely. That, I think, is what has made the school choice revolution possible, and I think it, it, it creates an opportunity for us to, to just take a fresh moment to say, um, you know, is this working? To, to, go, to go to something that Ian was talking about, the, that burning glass uh, study, I think, suggests that our entire K-12 education system is really working as intended for about a sixth of all of our young people, right? The archetypal success story that our system is designed to create is the kid who graduates high school, goes to college, gets a college degree, and then gets a job that requires a college degree. Well, that is the experience of, the, of one sixth of our population, and it's the one sixth of our population that already has, in general, the most advantages and is doing the best. Is that where we want to spend most of our money? And we need to ask ourselves, those sorts of big and systemic questions, and then at work at the local level, um, to and uh, particularly with higher ed at the federal level, to see if we can change that. If I could just jump on that. I mean, that goes to what Matt said in the beginning, right? The education was for the elites originally, and the system we've built is still for that elite track, and we have are failing all of these kids. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do in Virginia, again, is to break up this one size fits all and the same expectation for every child, and instead say, how do you make sure that we are providing a much clearer understanding earlier for families and students about the multiple ways to success and to be prepared for life, and that there's not one definition of what success looks like in this country. And we keep trying to fit everybody into the same elitist view of everybody needs to go get a fancy four-year degree. And part of what we're trying to do is start making the expectation that every student should have the opportunity of doing post-secondary work. I also think this is part of the whole rethinking of the last few years of high school, so that our expectation in Virginia that we're working on is ensuring that when you graduate from, you, from high school, you not only walk over the stage with a getting a high school degree, but you also get an associate's degree an industry-recognized credential, some work-based experience and internships that you've been exposed to the world beyond school walls, you've had experience in the world beyond school walls, and if you really have done something great, you've got expertise in something beyond the world of the school walls. You know, one of the things that just uh, will be seared in my brain on my last breath is something when I was working at the National Alliance of Business and trying to, it was a campaign called Making Academics Count. It was about trying to get employers to use transcripts to send a message that how they do in, co in high school and academically makes a difference into the rest of your life, to send those messages of hard work and merit and achievement matter. And there was a New York Times article on the campaign, and it was a quote from a young man who just graduated from high school, and his comment was, if someone had told me I needed to take algebra to get a job, I would have taken algebra. And I think this is one of the greatest failings that we are doing in this country, and it's so simple. It's informing people. It's giving them information. It's making sure people have, especially our youngest students and our families who don't know the rules and don't know the opportunities, that they have access to this information. Um, that's where discrimination is happening, right? Is some people get the memo about what you're supposed to do, and some people don't. And we need to start making sure that we are communicating to everybody and making sure everyone understands that there's dignity in work and that there are many, many pathways to go, and that our system right now, why in the part talking about higher education, it's no longer a pipeline. It's really about the fact that we're going to have to go in and out and get a, a training and education throughout their life as our world of work changes. And we need to prepare our students to how they, how they get smart about doing that earlier and understand those pathways. This is information I can really use because I'm going to find that quote about algebra and read it to my daughter <laughs> because, because she is a skeptic on this point. AEI Education believes in the intersection of policy and actual teenagers. Um, God was, um, let's go ahead. Uh, we'll take a few questions. Um, as always, I'll ask A, that you try, that you'd be kind enough to identify yourself, um, B, that you keep it reasonably brief, and C, that you actually ask a question. Uh, if we get 15 seconds in and I can't spot a question coming, we'll give somebody else a shot. Yes, sir. So Hi. I'm thinking about content. Who are you? Oh, my name is Ben Huff. I teach philosophy at Randolph-Macon College. I 
am really interested in civics education, and I'm wondering what we should call it, because I think Western Civ sounds kind of old and dusty and elitist and n culturally narrow, and the cutting edge of freedom today is in Eastern Europe and in Asia, in places like Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, but I'm not sure what else to call it. Love I'd it. love to hear what you think. Citizenship education, maybe? I mean, I do think that there's, there's, a, there's a point here in that, to get back to what I was saying earlier, the point of the K-12 system isn't to produce college students. It's to produce responsible adult citizens. Um, and, and so it's not just a question of this program, but really a question of the entire mindset. You could call it American studies and try to take that back <laughs> from the people who have stolen it. And, and I actually would try to lean to virtues-based education. Typically, when you think about civics education, what comes to mind is participation in the, uh, the extrinsic uh, democratic institutions. Do you understand the, the, the three branches of government? Do you voting, the electoral process, all of those things leaping over the virtues upon which uh, a self-governing society depends. Right? So if we have more and more young people that understand, again, this idea of courage, justice, temperance, wisdom, those are the core human virtues for which a civil society is based upon. So sometimes I think we do ourselves a disservice when we say civics, because in most people's minds, they're thinking about democratic institutions versus the intrinsic values and habits that we need to exhibit to maintain a self-governing society. The, the other piece implied by the question is, you know, is it a problem that we are so nasal ga navel gazing in our critiques of the United States? That it's, you, you know, American history looks much more checkered if you're not familiar with the millions slaughtered by Stalin or Mao or with the experience of Taiwan or Eastern Europe. So, you know, Florida, for instance, is now required that the victims of communism be, st is this the kind of thing that we ought to be pushing to incorporate into histor history instruction or citizenship instruction more broadly? Or does this feel like something that's just not gonna make sense to you know, most American parents and voters? I do worry about heaping too much responsibility on schools and on instructors. And when I was thinking about just this general story we've been telling, we've seen that as other uh, format forming, formative institutions have weakened, more burdens have been placed upon the schools. And I was, uh, kind of a revelatory moment for me during the pandemic was all of the problems generated with the school meals program when the schools were shut down because of COVID. And it was just to reveal, it was, it was a, a kind of a moment of recognition for me that our public schools are not just places of instruction. For so many students, they're places for a meal, in, in many cases, they're the only place where they have adults supervising them for any given amount of time. There's no religion allowed in them, in them anymore, but in place of religion, they receive a certain type of political education, right? So I, I, as much as I agree with the decision to, put, to incorporate the victims of communism um, material into the Florida textbooks, I am still very much worried that one, we're putting too much on the public schools, and two, that conservatives will simply abandon them, thinking that choice, these other structural reforms will provide an out, when in fact, as we know, and this has been stated in this panel, most Americans will continue to go to public schools, and the most vulnerable Americans are going to public schools, and we can't just let them, uh, we can't just pretend that that's not going to be a problem. So I would just again commend the Virginia Standards History and Civic Standards. Thank you for being here from Randolph-Macon. Um, we, it's really hard to put everything into standards, but I'm really proud of what we did um, because we were able to capture the good and the bad in history, world, world history. We um, strengthened civics education and topics at every single grade. And what I think is most important, the civics piece, we didn't just talk about it as government. We talked about it as personal responsibility in addition to rights. And I think that is what is missing in American education more than anything else. We talk about the rights. We do not talk about the responsibilities. Right. Next question. Thank you. 
Hi, Paul Edwards. I direct Wheatley Institute at Brigham Young University. Um, I'd love your thoughts about accreditation and its role in this. It, do you talk about it all in the book? What began as sort of a private quality control system has become a government licensed cartel for uh, you know, federal funds to flow. So just how does that play into thinking about potential changes? Yeah, well, we, have, well, um, we do discuss it in the book. And um, yeah, uh, you know, for instance, Steve Glacially's post-secondary commission is an attempt to create a new model of a creditor, which is actually focused on outcomes and earnings for students. Uh, shouldn't it be the only model? Um, I'm not sure that you, you know, an earnings-based accountability is the best approach for every institution. Uh, but the idea, you know, the way accreditation works today is it's basically a pay-to-play system in which colleges uh, pay money to have the accreditors come out, and then they count the books and they count the credentials. And after you build enough stacks of paper and report them, you get permission to spend a lot more federal funds and have your student take out a lot of federal money that doesn't get repaid um, <laughs> under the new order. And yeah, this is a fundamentally broken cartel. And you know, we argue in the book that you know there is the conservative impulse is both to be hesitant uh, to break old things because things that have been with us for a while are have frequently done so for a reason. But conservatives are also very conscious of self-interest and the way in which self-interest entities will tend to engage in conduct that's not necessarily good for the larger public. And I think you certainly see that in behavior of unions in the education space and absolutely see that in some of these behaviors around the college cartel and particularly about around the use of college credentials for hiring in ways that really ought to be legally problematic. Um, absolutely. Next question. Yes, sir. Behind you, Sean. Thanks. I'm Ben Woldovsky, a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia, author of The Career Arts. The question is, I love the mend it, don't end it theme, but if that is where conservatives are going to go, per Rick's you know, book, do you have any concern at all that all of the concern about, call it culture wars, erosion of classical liberal principles on campus, that that is leading people on the right to have a real distrust and disengagement in college when there is really a very robust evidence base that the economic benefits of college, despite the, all the concerns about debt and so forth, are really close to an all-time high. The wage differential is, remains very high. A record number of Americans now have four-year degrees. I think there's a lot of disinformation out there. And is there a danger that we'll get into a situation where the right says, nope, college isn't for the conservatives, and they end up hurting a lot of people? Ramesh? Well, yeah, I think that, that one of the negative side effects of the sort of thorough politicization of universities that we have seen is that it encourages an anti-intellectualism on the right that is already, in a certain sense, encoded into our DNA, um, since you know a certain skepticism and suspicion of expert control is sort of part of our creed, um, but it's also something that can be taken too far uh, and uh, and can become a certain just kind of philistinism. So absolutely, I think that that is a problem, um, but it is a problem that can't be corrected just on one end. So you can't just sort of lecture conservatives that they shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, although that's important to say. Um, but you also have to reform these institutions so they don't simply look like um, sort of factories for leftism that are paid for by people who don't want to pay for that. I just would also say that there's, uh, and thank you for being here from UVA, um, that, uh, that the returns on investment for post-secondary education and training are irrefutable, right? It's getting, it's more uh, that, but I would argue that the evidence is getting less and less it needs to be a four-year degree. Um, so one of the things that I'm really excited about is our community colleges, right? And we have some incredible data right now in Virginia on a program called our Workforce Credential Grant, which is a skin in the game for the student, the institution, and the state to encourage people to go in and get short-term credentials in the most in-demand areas and jobs that we cannot fill in Virginia. And it is a win-win-win. 
And what we're finding is right now, over a year ago, um, enrollment in those programs is up 20% of Virginia. So talk about a marketplace working, where we're incenting people to get the knowledge and skills that are, are most in demand in Virginia so we can fill the jobs and keep the economy going, and they're getting the skills. And what we're finding is the people taking advantage of these um, of this program are 25 to 65 year olds who have never had any interaction with higher education before, right? So that to me is about how do we start getting more creative about meeting the needs of employers, of the state, and of individuals who weren't re you know, ready for college at age 18. And you know, the majority of people in college today, you know, again, the elite view is everybody's 18 to 22 and they're going to frat parties, right? That is not the majority of people in higher ed and we need to actually start changing that narrative and changing our public policy to catch up with the reality of who's going to school today. Yeah, and, I, and I'd say it's not hostility towards college per se. It may be hostility to the idea that college has to be the only option immediately out of high school. There's great studies on career academies where, again, uh, students who are doing app apprenticeships and internships in high school or soon thereafter where they're getting credentials, able to work for a few years. And the data is pretty amazing, especially for low-income men who, who oftentimes end up going back to school a little bit later, more mature, a little bit of money in their pocket, much lower rates of non-marital births, right? Because these men are, have a more of a clear purpose of what it is that they're seeking to accomplish. So I think that's part of it. It's not hostility towards college. The, the data is irrefutable, but it's not the right answer for every student, certainly immediately coming out of high school. Matt, I'm gonna ask you to take us out. Final question, you, you, you alluded a little earlier to Bill Bennett's tenure as Secretary of Education. Um, and Bill was, you know, magnificent using the bully pulpit among, among his other gifts. Um, as we look forward, if you would point to one conservative leader, state official, or national figure who has spoken kind of most effectively or most impactfully on this whole bucket of issues over the last 30 or 40 years, or is there an individual or two that you would point to as kind of a role model for folks trying to get this right? Well, I think the Bennett Department of Education was extremely innovative and extremely effective. And using the bully pulpit is one of the things you can do in the federal government, as well as break up the accreditation cartel. That'd be on my to-do list for the next uh, conservative Department of Education. But um, I would say Bennett, I would say, you know, it, we mentioned William F. Buckley Jr. and Got a Man at Yale. The other big conservative book on education was The Closing of the American Mind, right? Um, and Alan Bloom, and that there too a focus on the content, not not the structure. What are we actually teaching? What do we expect of our schools and especially our institutions of higher education? And then finally, I think the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education has been doing incredible work. We haven't speaking, spoken too much about viewpoint diversity, but it is interesting to me when you just take the two bookends of this story we've been telling. Um, there, in, uh, got a man at Yale in 1951 was an attack on academic freedom. And now so much of the right and the efforts of institutions like FIRE is to protect academic freedom and to protect um, viewpoint diversity in order to continue the original mission of the university, which was the pursuit of truth. So I think we can look to all those figures um, uh, as models to follow um, in, in the years ahead. Hey, thanks much. Hey, I'd like to thank the panelists for a terrific conversation. I'd like to once again acknowledge my co-author, Mike McShane. Always a pleasure to work with. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, good afternoon and be well.